Since the establishment of the Leiden Asia Center in 2016, we annually published a report on cooperation with China in the field of higher education. The first report, published in early 2017, looked at the presence and significance of Chinese students in higher education in the Netherlands. That report was followed in late 2018 by a study that looked at European-Chinese academic cooperation and discussed the challenges and benefits of growing academic connections with China. An update of that report focused on the situation in the Netherlands and was published in 2019. And now there is a fourth report towards sustainable Europe-China cooperation in higher education and research. And I will be discussing this new publication with the two researchers, Ingrid de Hoge and Jonas Lammerkink. Welcome. Ingrid, four reports in less than four years. Aren't we a little bit exaggerating? Not at all. Um, if you look at the topics of the four reports, they are very different to our on the Netherlands to address Europe. Our first report in Europe, published in 2018, looked at the balance between the risks and the benefits of collaboration with China, whereas this report looked at how institutions, how universities can deal with these challenges. Uh, secondly, it is a relatively new topic. In 2018, our first uh, LAP report, Line Asia Center report, on collaboration with China was actually the first serious study on this topic. There had been some media reports, but not an extensive study. Um, so it really filled a gap. And if you look also at the dynamic developments in this area, uh, there's really a need for more publications on this topic. So actually, I, I foresee another report in 2021. In this last report, you focus on the need to optimize collaboration with China. It is not at all a call to reduce collaboration. In view of the alarming reports on the risks involved in working with China, why do you make that choice? Well, collaboration with China in higher education and research, be it in the shape of uh, science cooperation or exchanges uh, of students and scholars, is actually very beneficial for Europe. Already in 2018, our report found that uh, most uh, stakeholders uh, think that the benefits outweigh the risks of collaboration. Uh, China is a science powerhouse. Their quality in research is rapidly increasing. In some areas, they are even more advanced than uh, scientists in Europe. Uh, they have a huge pool of talents, they have the equipment, they have a lot of funding. Uh, but also, in, in general, to advance science, we need to collaborate with China. And let me also emphasize that a lot of this collaboration is actually without problems. So we need to collaborate with China, but we should do it in a much better and safer way. And Ingrid, on the other hand, how crucial for China is this international collaboration? Very important. Higher education and research are top political priorities for China. They need to deliver an important contribution to China's overall development. And if you also look at China's ambitions, they are enormous. Uh, by 2035, China wants to be a global power, an advanced uh, country in the area of science and higher education. And by 2049, it wants to be a global leader in this area. And uh, these, uh, these mottos are not just slogans, they are underpinned by lots of strategies and enormous funding. So China invests in this and it looks very strategically at uh, which areas of research to focus and with whom to cooperate abroad. This international collaboration is still important for China because yes, they are a growing power, They're the quality of their research is very rapidly increasing, but nevertheless, uh, in many areas, they still have much to learn. And uh, they also invest a lot in international collaboration. So you could say that this linkage between the general Chinese ambitions and the uh, importance they attach to the advancement of the sciences, as was more or less expressed in Made in China 2025, a policy document that appeared in 2015. Could you say that this document has worked as a wake-up call for the external world 
to make clear that these ambitions were linked and that China's plans to become a real powerhouse in scientific way led also to a kind of dominance of science and, te science and technology in the international academic collaboration. Uh, yes, you could indeed uh, say that. Made in China 2025 has made Europeans aware that China has a strategic vision also in the area of science and higher education. And if you look also at the research results, you see, for example, that not only overall research output is growing very rapidly, China is now the biggest producer, but that also in the natural sciences, uh, this output is growing. In that area, China is first. Uh, and their impact, uh, so the, the, the number of uh, high-level citations is growing very rapidly. So probably they will be the number one in a couple of years. And for example, if, if you look at China's research institutions, China's Academy of Science is now the top number one science institution in the world, according to Nature. And they rank uh, first in the areas of uh, chemistry and physics. So, these results, of course, serve as a wake-up call in Europe. And I think that is why it is so important that Europe gets its act together, that it invests in science, that it takes a strategic look on science collaboration, and in particular in doing that with regard to China. Jonas, we now turn to you. You look at the situation in various European countries. Do you see the discussion? On getting the act together and more awareness of also uh, behaving more strategically, just like China. Do you see that in these countries as well? Well, uh, Lily, um, we've looked uh, at eight European countries uh, as well as at the, the level of the European Union. And what we found is that this discussion is definitely underway uh, in most of these countries. Uh, but there is uh, a serious level of variation between countries. I think uh, the United Kingdom is, a very, uh, is an example that stands out. There is a lot of attention on the issue of uh, risks involved in uh, knowledge cooperation with China. And this is partly the result of the deeply developed uh, collaboration between the UK and China. The UK uh, receives the most Chinese students uh, in all of Europe and there is a deeply developed uh, cooperation in the field of research as well. So, uh, automatically there is more attention uh, on this topic in, in the UK. Um, for example, uh, a committee of the House of Commons um, has published a report last year in which it mentioned that there is a, a serious level of uh, political interference by China uh, in UK campuses um, uh, in response to the uh, national security law in Hong Kong. Uh, several universities, for example Oxford University, uh, now uh, lets uh, their students um, hand in uh, essays and reports anonymously to make sure that they cannot face retaliation in, in, when they're back in Hong Kong or China. Um, there have also been some documents published uh, to address uh, these risks, um, for example by the government but also by Universities UK, which represents uh, over a hundred universities, and also by academics who are concerned about academic freedom. Um, Germany uh, is also an interesting case. Uh, there has been a serious shift uh, recently. Uh, if you look at policy documents uh, from a few years ago um, on this topic, there is no mention of human rights uh, or uh, academic freedom at all. So it wasn't uh, um, a topic of discussion back then. Uh, but now there is more attention. Uh, questions are being raised in the German parliament. And there has also been a, uh, a document with guiding questions published by the uh, Conference of German uh, Rectors, which represents over 30 universities, uh, also to address these risks. Um, other countries as well, such as Sweden and the Netherlands, have seen publications uh, with guiding questions. Um, in other countries, this discussion is also on the way, uh, without resulting in actual policy documents yet. In Belgium, for example, uh, there has been a lot of media attention uh, for this uh, topic and this has not resulted in policy documents yet, but universities are working on this and security agencies are also uh, forcing universities to take these risks into account. Uh, in other countries, and this is also noteworthy, uh, there is somewhat of a discussion, uh, but not on a large scale and at least not uh, very publicly. 
Italy and France are also uh, noteworthy examples because in these two countries uh, the discussion doesn't seem to have been developed that much. Um, there also have not been, uh, at least to our knowledge, uh, any uh, guidelines or policy documents uh, published uh, publicly, um, nor is there a, a public discussion uh, on this topic. Uh, yes, one of the shortcomings the European Union is often accused of is its total lack of unity when it comes to China policy. Uh, is there any initiative on a central European level of uh, formulating a common policy with respect to the academic collaboration with China? Well, Lily, actually there has been uh, an initiative uh, in response to the strategic outlook uh, published by the uh, European Commission uh, which labelled China a systemic rival. Uh, the Director General for uh, Research and Innovation uh, organised an event to discuss uh, the risks involved in uh, research and education co collaboration with China. Um, and this event was also um, the kickstart to developing uh, specific uh, guidelines in this regard on the level of the European Union. So there's definitely uh, a European-wide initiative. Uh, however, our report, uh, which looks at this question uh, from a European-wide perspective um, and also compares uh, guidelines from different countries, uh, to our knowledge is uh, unique in its kind so far. Uh, so this is the first effort um, uh, to collect these, these different initiatives and which allows for comparison and to learn from uh, the approaches that other countries apply. In this report you also clearly show that all countries concerned, um, there is a linkage between the discussion about uh, cooperation within the realm of higher education and the general discussion on relations with China. I mean, it's obvious that this is not just in the Netherlands, but you see it all around Europe. Could those two be disconnected in a way? Politicians, uh, the media and Western societies in general uh, look more critically to China, and uh, often rightfully so, uh, and it is especially these forces that raise questions about um, research cooperation uh, and education cooperation with China, um, and uh, individual researchers and universities and other institutions um, are aware of these questions and take them seriously, but they also uh, want to make sure that this doesn't affect all uh, cooperation directly. Uh, they um, don't want to create a climate of suspicion. Uh, not all students uh, from China are directly uh, spies. Uh, and as uh, Ingrid already said, there's a lot of successful cooperation uh, with China that is very vital also for European research and innovation. So uh, we need to make sure that this does not uh, directly negatively impact uh, all this successful cooperation. Like any other reports, you finish up with making recommendations. Now, if each of you could pick one recommendation that would really contribute to finding a solution of the shortcomings of the European strategy right now, what would that be, Ingrid? Yeah, I would like to take an overall uh, recommendation. Our conclusion is that in general there's more awareness and more and more stakeholders, both at government level and at the institutions, are taking actions to develop an approach towards sustainable collaboration, but this is a very daunting task. And the most important recommendation is for universities to just get started and work together with the government, work together with other universities. Some have already developed such approaches, you can learn from them, uh, because it is really vital to make this uh, collaboration sustainable. So just get started and seek help. And then from my side, um, what we also think is very important is that these uh, guidelines or other approaches should be designed in a way uh, that allows researchers uh, and institutions uh, to have more confidence in their cooperation with China um, and helps them to formulate responses to questions that are being right, raised by society um, and because, as we already said, there is a lot of uh, successful cooperation uh, and this cooperation could thereby be empowered uh, and continue with more confidence. Okay, well, thank you, Ingrid and Jonas, for uh, providing us a preview of the report. The full report um, towards sustainable Europe-China cooperation in higher education and research will become available on October 28th on our website, leidenasiacenter.nl 
and we hope that you will enjoy reading it. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you also for the two researchers, Jonas and Ingrid. Uh, good luck with any uh, follow-up report, which is bound to appear at some point. Thank you very much indeed.